in our climate emergency is the extreme weather emergency, and we thank the Adrenaline uh, Foundation of Dallas Africa you can do it for uh, supporting us. Um, we have entered, or rather, we have been pushed by big money, big corporations, and uh, power mad governments into the age of climate destruction. This age will not cease, it will get worse. We have entered an unprecedented age of global climate destruction and accelerating climate change. As we heard uh, very recently in the talk from the World Meteorological Organization, even so, there is no change from the fossil fuel world economy driving the global destruction. Increasing extreme weather events are the most damaging category of impacts to both human populations and crops. Um, the IPCC, by the way, includes uh, forest fires in that category. I'm just going to very briefly show you two headlines of the top two the latest shocking headline-making climate change science publications, and our experts will talk and explain more about science. First one, headline from the University of Oxford, December 9th, Global Food Production at Risk from Large Atmospheric Waves in the Jet Stream. Massive heat waves occurring across several major northern hemisphere agricultural regions, the best region of the planet, uh, at once, simultaneously. That's what we're facing. And this can also lead to the opposite, uh, further south of the jet stream, uh, with extraordinary torrential heavy rains and destruction from flooding and landslides. This is what we're in for. Number two. Headline, new regional accelerating feedback from Arctic ecosystems already on the way. That's from the uh, National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration, their annual Arctic report of December 2019, just a couple of days ago. Also, the Arctic has switched from a carbon sink to a carbon source, and 2019 average air temperature in the Arctic was. 1.9 degrees C. So I'm just going to pass on now to Paul Beckwith, who will be able to tell you more about that science. Okay, so let's uh, let's let um, Regina say a few words first. Uh, yes, thank you so much for those headlines, um, Dr. Carter. And though I'm sure most of you watching and most of you here know who they need to know about Russia, I will go ahead and end in the so that was what? Dr. Peter Carter, who we just heard from, and he's a retired physician who's practiced medicine for almost 40 years and is now devoting the rest of his life to um, climate science. He's also a founding director of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, and he's also the founder of the Climate Emergency Institute in Canada, to his right, the National Beckwith, who has an engineering and physics background, and teaches official day of COP. I mean, first of all, we know it's a bit of a farce. I mean, if you talk to any of the parking attendants or any of the people, you know, working in this uh, big convention center, they're all working tomorrow, right? They know that, you know, no agreement's being reached and, uh, you know, it'll go down to the wire tonight and they'll say, well, we're getting close, but we need an extra day of negotiations. And, you know, they'll repeat the same thing uh, tomorrow and about eight o'clock or nine o'clock tomorrow night, we might hear, well, we're getting very, very close to a breakthrough. And, you know, at 11.59, they'll sign an agreement saying, you know, 
basically, you know, not too much, but they'll claim it as a big improvement over previous agreements, a big breakthrough. And, you know, it'll be COP 25, 25 COPs and still squat, really, because the metric that's really important is the, um, the level of greenhouse gases, uh, specifically CO2 in the atmosphere. I mean, if you look at that curve, um, you know, measurements have been done um, since the you know, 50s and 60s on Mauna Loa and on the mountaintop in uh, Hawaii, and those CO2 numbers just keep going up, uh, and they're going up at accelerated rates. Now, <clears throat> it's common for a rise of over three parts per million in one year, whereas before it was, uh, you know, a few decades ago, a decade or so ago, it was two parts per million was the highest, and you know, any, any decade before then, it was 1.5 or 1 rise. So that curve is still accelerating upward. So until we turn that curve, stop that curve and turn it around, you know, all of this talk at these agreements and so on is, is, is just talk. So um, what I want to talk, I want to talk just for a few minutes before, before uh, you know, getting, getting Peter Wadden's views on some of his Arctic expeditions. But, you know, it's interesting um, that, um, I don't know, quite a few years ago now, there was a meeting of some people in the UK, including John Neeson and, and Peter first, and they, they started this group called the AMEG, the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, and I quickly heard about it and joined, and so did Peter Carter. So, you know, we've been, uh, you know, talking about this sort of thing for many, many years. Um, but one thing I want to do, just, just point out the emphasis is we, we need we've got lots of scientists working on specific pieces of the of the uh, climate issue uh, but we don't have enough people that are looking at the overall picture and joining the dots and connecting all the different components of climate um, beyond uh, studying climate chess is a passion of mine and I look at the chessboard, I look at scientists as the individual pieces working you know, on very limited domains. You might have a glaciologist specializing in one particular glacier in one part of the world, knowing everything about that that one could possibly know, whereas another person is working on atmospheric physics and another person is working on soils and there's no, uh, you know, we're very specialized, we're very compartmentalized in science and we need more people, we need more chess players as opposed to chess pieces and squares on a chessboard. We need more people who are looking at the connections between the squares and the pieces and, you know, it's not the pieces that decide how to move. Somebody's directing the overall picture, looking at the big picture. So that's all I try to do, try to join the dots on the climate system, how it's changing, how quickly it's changing and where we're heading. So, um, not to talk too much, I, the, the, the basic elevator pitch is the, we're getting tremendous warming of the planet because our, our, we've changed the chemistry of the atmosphere and oceans and uh, through greenhouse gas, you know, what, what, the, what chemical components there are in the atmosphere. We've changed the way the atmosphere and oceans respond to heat so that the additional heat that is being trapped is causing warming. The warming is highly non-uniform. So uh, high elevation mountaintops are warming twice as fast as low elevation. Land is warming twice as fast as ocean. Um, the Arctic is warming four to five times faster in the high Arctic than lower latitudes. The reason the jet streams exist is because the Arctic is cold, the equator is warm, and as the Arctic warms like crazy, it lowers the temperature difference to the equator, so the jet streams slow down and become wavier, they become stuck in place. So extreme weather events increase in frequency, severity, and duration. And the other thing that's key is right now the center of cold in the Arctic is basically, you know, slightly offset from the North Pole towards Greenland. But what, in an Arctic without sea ice, the center of cold will be Greenland itself. Center of Greenland is at, uh, um, at you know, it's, it's shifted, it's at 80, 80, uh, three, or 73 degrees north latitude is the center of Greenland, which is 17 degrees shifted from the North Pole. So it makes lot perfect logical sense that the jet streams in a world with no Arctic sea ice will be centered around Greenland, and thus will be completely offset. So not only are the jet streams slowing down and becoming wavier, but they're gonna change location, 
We rely on the jet streams for our existing weather conditions. And when the jet streams are in a different place, then we have, we'll have to relearn how and where to grow food. So clearly, it's pretty logical that there's going to be global food shortages very, very soon when there's no Arctic sea ice. So these things are just kind of obvious if you, if you really think about them. So anyway, I've gone on long enough. Thank you all for attending. Um, it's been a very interesting Hopefully, you know, we get a tipping point in human, human understanding of the risks from climate change and then a tipping point in how we act to address these problems. Hopefully, you know, that can't happen, you know, it should have happened yesterday and last week, day before, but it's gotta, it'll happen now, I think. You know, maybe is Greta a catalyst for this? You know, we will see, we hope so. Okay, so I'll pass it over to, uh, to, to uh, Peter, who I, I just met for the first time, you know, we've been working for, it seems like forever, and we just met in person uh, yesterday. Well, I think it would be amazing to have a few words about that specifically about ice and about uh, the interactions with ice that are affecting our present climate emergence. Uh, I should add that we've just seen a very, very moving talk by Stuart Scott about uh, the person who's doing the most to destroy our planet at the moment, that's the President Trump. And I uh, have sadly to say that as of today, there's a new kid on the block that Britain has just had the BBC to uh, elect. Britain's Trump was Prime Minister, that's uh, Boris Johnson. So we sadly now have two nations run by lunatics. Um, 